going to move you over to Harold Browning, who will talk about uh, macaque welfare in rescue centers. So over to Harold now. Hello and welcome. My name is Harold Browning and I'm a captive animal welfare advisor for Animals Asia. I hope you're all well and staying safe at the moment in these turbulent times. In Hanoi, we've just entered another lockdown. So today I'm doing this presentation from, from my room. Um, so this presentation is standards in rescue centers and what to do when resources are scarce. So no. Don't do that, don't panic. Now, although the title of this lecture is what to do when resources are scarce, that's not necessarily what I'm gonna to say to you. There is no uh, correct way of doing it. There are incorrect ways, but there is no one set correct way that we can provide the best for animals. There's different personalities, different uh, situations when the cacks are in, different traumas from their lives. Each rescue center has different resources and a range of other challenges it faces. So in this short lecture, I just wanted to say what we do in the hope that sharing what we do might promote some ideas in you or that you might have things to say back to me so that I can improve my care that we do here in Vietnam. The reason I've been chosen to speak on this topic is that I work with government rescue centers here in Vietnam, so not my own rescue center. And my job is to improve the captive care there for designer facilities, uh, release methodologies, husbandry, diet, pretty much anything. But these are all within the confines of government rescue centres and their budgets. I want to make the problem a, a government problem, so I use government funding or work with the government to apply for government funding and don't directly invest Animals Asia money most of the time. Now also because we're a bit short for time within this lecture, I'm going to generalise quite a lot. There's a lot of different ways of doing things, as I mentioned. There's a lot of different macaque problems, uh, different macaque solutions, and just different macaques. And so I will just say what we do, and hopefully we'll all be able to share ideas from it. So with that said, here is a bit of background about Vietnam. So as I mentioned, I work in Vietnam. I mostly work with the Hanoi Wildlife Rescue Center, and that will form the base of the methodology I speak through today. In that rescue center alone, we rescue between 100 and 150 macaques a year. Um, I work with six other centers. Probably in total, we take in about 250 macaques a year, and those are just the ones that make it to rescue centers that I work with. A lot of macaques go to other rescue centers. A lot of macaques are released straight in the wild after confiscation here. So there's a lot of problems and a lot of things to solve. Um, so in the Hanoi Wildlife Rescue Centre, as I mentioned, we take 105 macaques a year from five species. So in 2019, that broke down as 25 long-tail macaques, 29 pigtail macaques, 10 stump-tail macaques, 23 Assamese macaques, and 18 rhesus macaques. In addition to that, we take in about another 900 animals a year, so over 1,000 animals a year in total on average, and house animals that aren't releasable back into the wild for the duration of their life. So this sounds challenging already. The final thing I'll say is that the rescue center itself is less than a hectare in size. So there are a lot of challenges and this, obviously we're always aiming to get better. So the method I'm talking you through today is not a static process. It's always, we're always looking to improve and we always are improving. And so today I'll go through the process we use there and the other centers I use, starting with quarantining. So here in Vietnam with quarantine, owing to the number of animals that come in, the only real way of, of doing it at all is to have a large area or a large room and then to quarantine animals that come in in the same stage within their isolation cage or their quarantine cage or their transport cage. This way we have the flexibility. If we had set dens, we would just have that number of dens and only take that number of animals as we can use the transport cages, we can therefore have X number of animals that we can hold and then set up other quarantine areas if we need them. Here at Scorpion's temporary quarantine, you can see what that looks like with the isolation cages all, all laid out in a row. All these macaques arrive together from a single uh, confiscation. Now, when their quarantine facility is actually finished, it'll look 
a little bit more like this. You can see it's got the two sides so that you can quarantine animals separately on each side. And then we're going to look at actually bringing in like a curtain that can hang down and, and stops water from going between the different sections, of course, biological materials and infections and things like that. The isolation cages have got two doors. They've got one on each side. Now, the reason for that is for providing options. So in this instance, during quarantine, because uh, social contact is so important to macaques, they can actually be placed together. And then socializations and integrations can begin to happen even at this quarantine phase. Um, the cages in the original video and this picture we show you later are actually unfurnished. So a furnished version would look more like this, but I'll, I'll talk more about furnishing of cages later when we get into the more detailed stuff of where macaques actually, the cages they actually live in for most of their lives. One thing that is worth noting with these cages is that um, if you turn them on their side, Scorpion have found, they're actually remarkably good for catching macaques if that's ever needed for solving um, a human and macaque interfaces. Milena, that's for, that's for you. Um, so they've attached a, a mechanism by when the macaque touches the food, it pulls out, and because the crate's on the side, the door naturally falls downwards. It's worth noting with the doors that they're built actually on the inside of the cage, as this helps with the rafting together, both for the uh, isolation cages in quarantine setting, and also for when you're attaching them to the socialization cage, so you don't need to be pulling macaques out, you can just attach the cages next to each other and the macaque can, can run through. And so I should probably take this opportunity to say hello to Gunung and Ali of Scorpion, because I know they're watching this, and they've, they've been doing excellent work out there, just about to start their own macaque rescue centre, so I've been helping them with that. Um, that's pretty much everything I'll say for quarantine, because time is short. For disease screening protocols and things like that, we have those, and if anybody wants them, I can, I can share them with you, but I won't, that will take too long to go through all of that, I'll miss the rest of it. Also, so with our um, socialization cages, where the macaques are mostly, before they're released, if they are released. Um, the husband jeep for that is quite similar to the quarantine section, which is why I've skimmed over quarantine. Um, the only difference being the concentration for biological materials transferring over between the different sections you might have with your macaques. So that's something to bear in mind. So with that said, we'll move on to the socialization areas and the, the mainstay of what I want to talk about. So when I arrived at the Hanoi Wildlife Rescue Center, many moons ago, I was fresh-faced and all of that. Um, the situation I found the macaques was uh, this one. So all the macaques, once they've come out of quarantine, they're all then put into single cages because there just wasn't enough space once you got over a certain number. The cages only had one door, so you couldn't shift the macaques to do any work inside, so doing furnishings or anything like that was impossible. Um, which is why you'll notice with our two-door one, as well as putting them together integrations, you can put them together to enable you to shift the macaque should you need to do anything inside the cage during the quarantine time. So the stress behaviours from this keeping was, they were pretty bad. There was a lot of a lot of bad and negative problems with this that we needed to address. And it wasn't done out of cruelty, it was just done out of the literature that I have and I have learned from is available in my mother tongue, is available in English, whereas in Vietnam the, the literature and the learning is very, it's impossible to find, it certainly was back then, and so they were just having to do whatever they thought was right without any, any, any further information. So from this, we move to, to these cages, which actually take up the same floor space as the individual ones. And immediately, we found that having the macaques able to get up above the height of humans lowers the stress behaviours enormously. Um, so here, they're, they're three and a half metres high, so the macaques can go right up. Then at the back of them, what we've actually done is created areas so the macaques can go and they're visually separated from each other, even if they share the same cage. And this seems to be very important because the macaques only have one space with which to look out from or which to look for dominant individuals if they're being integrated or if they already exist in a group. And that minimising of the areas where potentially dominant macaques or other stresses could come from seems to mean the macaques, well, they exhibit less stress behaviour that we observe, and they seem to be more settled within themselves. Um, this is obviously for macaques in a group, 
um, setting because we've we've begun integrating them when they get to this stage because uh, social contact is so important for macaques in the wild and so important for their well-being within captivity. The other idea is that releasing macaques within groups means that they don't have to go searching for social contact, which if they can't find, it's possible that they're therefore looking for humans because they know humans from their time in captivity. Um, the reason why the looking out for potential stresses in this way we find is important for the macaques is because in the wild a macaque would be able to retreat to wherever it wanted to go to, to feel safe. And it could also retreat from stresses to an area and it knows that the group is over here and it is now over here so it just needs to look in this direction most of the time. And so we've kind of taken that idea into captivity where macaques can go in one area, not an area where they can get cornered, because obviously a stressor comes up and then just catches them, but an area where they only have to pay attention to one area, and that is where stress can come from, but there's still room to escape should the dominant individual come up. And now we've taken that one further. The reason for the new design was necessity. We were going to rescue nine macaques from a park in Ninbin, and they were going to come in three separate groups. And so we had, we were absolutely full at the time, and we needed a new cage. Now, the only space we had left in the centre was six metres by six metres. And so we made a design which was this. Again, it was important to get the height, so it's up to four metres high, but this time it's separated into two floors. You can see on here there's a door and another door that go from upstairs to downstairs in enclosure A and B. Uh, another reason for this design was the flexibility of it. There's so many doors that you can attach transport crates to the edge as well, should you need to, if you need to separate individuals, or if you're bringing another individual to a larger group where the, all the dens and the enclosures are already taken. Then, of course, there's the option of attaching another socialization cage to the... Sorry, another isolation cage to the isolation cage just again creating more flexibility in what you can do and more more room for changes. Another thing to remember is a lot of the macaques that we receive are frightened of humans. They've had traumatic experiences and they're generally very scared. And in order for to change that it takes a lot of time with keepers of spending time with the macaques and building positive relationships. And we have macaques come in so fast that that's not always possible. So sometimes we have to rely on what I refer to as opportunistic husbandry, which is where you can clean an area because the macaques aren't in it, so you can close off the other areas. Or you can bring all the macaques to one side, say, if you used den C with enclosure B, you could feed all of that area and the macaques would come to that area and then you can go around and do the other side, which doesn't necessarily need positive relationships or with the macaques, it's just the cage gives you the options to do it. So I mentioned about that we had nine macaques coming and this is what the cage was built for. In the end, we had 21 long-tailed macaques arrive and they were all from separate confiscations, but they all arrived on the same day. And so we had to integrate them into groups using the cage and using its flexibility. I mentioned briefly about the opportunistic husbandry. What we actually did was set up two PVC gutters down the side. Now they span three enclosures essentially because they do upstairs, downstairs and the den on the corresponding side. So by scattering food all the way down there, all the macaques come to that side so you can clean everything on the other side and then vice versa to do the next part. One thing I mentioned was keepers not having much time. And so I just like to speak a little bit more about how we compensate with our enrichment for keepers not having time in our attempt to automate it. So firstly, in the design of the cage, where it's built, it looks out on the far side as a bear enclosure, so the macaques can see the bears fairly clearly. Then on the left of the cage, as you look at it, there is a, a hornbill enclosure and a woolly neck stork enclosure. So the macaques have visual stimulation. Also, the sight line towards the camera goes quite far, so the macaques can see all around. So imme immediately they have stimulation from what can be seen. The next thing is what is around the enclosure. So you can see the trees above it in this photo. And that uh, one on the right is a longan tree. The one on the left is a sow tree, which is the Vietnamese name. I don't actually know the English name. I just know the Vietnamese for it. 
And so those grow and the macaques can reach them when they, when they grow over and they can grab and pluck fruits from them. And they watch them um, fruiting and going into season. And then they're aware when they can take the fruits and they're constantly checking on this and, and living their lives according to, according to it. Um, then you can also see on this side, we have a planter along the front with a finer mesh. So again, as the plant grows, the macaques can constantly be picking parts off it. And then there's two more planters on the roof, which you can just about see here. And then they eventually grew up as well. And the macaques can pick leaves off them as they grow. The planters, as well as enabling the macaques to pick off extra bits, they also attract a range of insects towards the enclosure. Um, the long and tree in particular has a lot of ants that grow on it. And when these make their way towards the cage, the macaques pick these off. And we went one further with this by introducing um, bug hotels and bee hotels also around the enclosure so that these insects go through the enclosure, the macaques pick them off, and there's constantly stimulation from this. And this is types of enrichment which don't really need the keeper input. I mean, they water the plants, but the plants growing by themselves is providing enrichment. Then the next thing we looked at is processes that the keepers are doing anyway that could potentially be enriching. So on each day, the keepers are going in, cleaning the enclosure, cleaning the waters, feeding the macaques, and then, and then getting out. Um, so in the process of doing the water, well, they clean the water out and then just refill the water with a hose pipe. But instead of just filling that water up, there is the potential that they can fill other tubs with a small hole in them that then trickles into another tub, trickles into another tub, trickles into another tub. And this creates a flow and a movement of water. So just in the process of filling up the waters, can this become an enriching process? And so we, we're playing with that at the moment to see what we can do. Then another idea is to have set halls that are both inside and outside the enclosure so that things will naturally fall on the outside and the macaques try and work their way to get them from outside to inside using the pool. I've got a photo of that here. Then with feeding is another standard process, we're looking at attaching baskets at the top of the cage so that when we do small diced food and scatter it, we can throw it just into the top of the cage and it will, some will collect in the baskets, some will fall on the top floor and some will go through to the second floor. So there's this distribution amongst the cage and amongst the different rooms. So again, macaques at different places in the social hierarchy can still eat completely out of the view of dominant individuals. Then we were using enrichment calendars with which to um, govern what enrichment the macaques have on what day. But unfortunately, due to the constraints of having so many animals, so the, the two keepers who are looking after macaques, they're also in charge of the small mammal section. Now, I've mentioned that they can have up to 70 macaques in our centre at any one time. In addition to that, they can also have the, the leopard cats, the civets, the reptiles. All of this stuff will, will come under them as well. So they can have anywhere up to 200 to 300 animals. So with the enrichment calendars, we were getting to a stage where it was just impossible for the keepers to keep up. Like, they just could not do that much in enrichment. And they were being checked by it by managers because they had set calendars that they, the managers knew they had to follow. So instead of that, we moved to just having the ideas of the enrichments on posters around the centre. And then we could leave it up to the keepers to decide if, well, first of all, if they had time, but also they were more flexible to adapt their enrichment to what was available in the centre. So if a banana tree had fallen down, they could go and just give that to the macaques. Or if the, the ficus rosica that we have in the centre had particular fruit that day, and that was going spare, the hornbills weren't having it, then the macaques could get these novel items that were outside of their enrichment calendars at the time. And this gave us greater flexibility to provide different enrichment, and enrichment that fitted what was available rather than having set calendars of what was going on. Because although I'm running out of time, I will mention that we have found that um, constant novel items are very enriching to macaques, and even items that we don't think are particularly exciting to the macaques can be. And so just different sticks, different, like this, the piles of soil, sand, any novel item, just that constantly seems to be more effective in, in promoting well-being and natural behaviours than the big bulky kind of just puzzle feeders that are set for one thing, especially when, when looking at groups. Now, each one has its place. I'm just saying that don't underestimate what just a pile of leaves 
throughout the day different leaves can have than just purpose-built big novel items. And with my last 30 seconds, I'll just say the next thing we're looking at is actually temporary cages that are made up of panels. So a panel such as this one here, and then they can be attached to socialization cages like this. And then you can arrange the enclosures and build them to any situation and to any to anything. So as this picture shows, you can have two floors, you can have them built around banana trees and built however you wish. Hi there, that was great. Thank you, Harry. Um, really interesting stuff once again. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the chat, but we have sort of, we're running really perfectly on time, which is surprising because we expected to maybe run a little late, like often happens. And so we've sort of overscheduled break time. And what we've decided we can do is to have an impromptu question and answer session.